For two months, a family of six had slept beneath a plastic tarp in the cold rain. 22-year-old Maria Lubia Kerakama Tanigama held her newborn and two toddlers tight, using her body to keep them warm as nighttime temperatures dropped into the 40s. Her husband and their six-year-old lay next to her on a thin mat, the only thing between them and the Bogota dirt. Since last September, an indigenous community, refugees forced off their land by armed groups from Colombia's ongoing rural violence, has been living in Bogota's central Olaya Herrera National Park, many cycling in and out of government-subsidized housing, a few months in an apartment, a few months on the streets, back to an apartment, and then back to the streets. Desperate to break this cycle, indigenous leaders tried once more to demand a solution from the government. In late September, hundreds of evicted families marched through Bogota for 14 hours before camping out in National Park in the heart of the capital. They set up hundreds of plastic tarps between the park's monuments, fountains, and trees. Perhaps here, in one of the city's most prominent parks, they thought their cries for help would be impossible to ignore. However, the Colombian authorities have been struggling to dissolve the camp, which has housed up to 1,500. As of recently, many have left. But a determined group remains, including children, dozens elderly, and several pregnant women. What is going on, everyone? This is the Leo Podcast, where we talk about various educational topics, especially those impacting the Latin American community. In today's episode, we're going to be talking about an indigenous community forced off their land by armed groups from Colombia's ongoing rural violence that has been living in Bogota's Central National Park. For months, the situation in the park gained limited attention. Then, on November 28th, the death of a 21-month-old Embera child in the park stimulated coverage by the national press, increasing pressure on the authorities to address the issue. I'm your host, Kevin Munoz. This is today's free episode. If you want early access to episodes and bonus episodes, you can find that right now on our patreon.com slash latinamericaneo and if not then enjoy this one the displacement of indigenous people from their lands has been a reality in colombia for decades since the spanish colonization of the americas in the 16th century the indigenous people who survived imported diseases and massacres have been repeatedly deprived of their ancestral lands First colonial and later Colombian settlers pushed them away from agriculturally fruitful areas towards marginal mountain ranges or the Amazon. Those who stayed had to enter a feudal-like servant system, including the payment of terajes, working without pay for landowners in exchange for being allowed to live on and cultivate small plots of land. Colombia's armed internal conflict since the 1960s further intensified violence against indigenous people, particularly the emergence of right-wing paramilitary groups. Since the 1980s, paramilitaries have conducted brutal massacres and disappearances among Colombia's rural and indigenous population. These attacks were often carried out with the blessing of large landowners, local and national politicians, and state authorities to strengthen the landowners' grasp on lands and to cut down social protests. Fast forward to late September, indigenous communities are still being forced off their land by armed groups from Colombia's ongoing rural violence. Hundreds of evicted families marched through Bogota for 14 hours before camping out in the national park in the heart of the capital. They set up hundreds of plastic tarps between the park's monuments, fountains, and trees. You might be asking yourself, why this national park? Well, this is because this national park, located in the heart of the capital, is one of the city's most prominent parks. Therefore, they can't be easily ignored. However, as you can imagine, living in a park comes at a steep cost as far as living conditions go. Hundreds of families are still living in the park. Indigenous leaders have turned down the city's offer to transfer the families to an indoor shelters on the outskirts of Bogota. They are demanding permanent collective accommodations and government support for their safe return to their land. But as the sides try to reach an agreement, children are falling ill. The park's leaders have been transporting about three to four children to the hospital each day, almost all of them under the age of two. 
And many of their parents who are used to relying on traditional healers are reluctant to send their children away to medical professionals that they don't trust. Don't go anywhere. We'll be right back after this quick break. What is going on, everyone? I've decided to use this time to feature other indie podcasters that have amazing podcasts that I think you would enjoy. For today's featured podcast is our sister podcast, A Shot of Truth, a podcast focused on celebrating storytelling for and knowledge sharing with undocumented people and those impacted by borders with the lovely host Victoria Matei. If that sounds like something that you'd enjoy, then make sure you give them a listen and tell them that Kev sent you. Now let's get back to today's episode. The most tragic example of these horrendous living conditions is the case of Yonkin. After two months of living in the open air in this high-altitude city amid smoke from cooking fires, Gerakama's 21-month-old son, Yonkin, fell ill. First came diarrhea, vomiting, then he became drowsy and struggled to breathe. An ambulance rushed him to a hospital just blocks away. By the time Yonkin arrived, it was too late. He had already suffered a cardiorespiratory arrest. Before his death, doctors said he had the stomach flu, severe malnutrition, and severe dehydration. According to Jairo Montañez, a leader representing the indigenous communities occupying the park, the death of Yonkin can be explained with one word, arrogance. Arrogance on behalf of a government that has wanted to ignore the problem and make it invisible. To indigenous leaders, the toddler's death underscores the government's neglect of the displaced victims it has promised to support. To local health officials, it was the result of the community's refusal to accept the city's offers to move them to safer living conditions. In the 10 days before Jonkin died, city officials say indigenous leaders refused to let public health teams into the park. However, the leaders deny those allegations. What makes Jonkin's death even more tragic is that according to healthcare workers, these were all preventable causes, being just steps from one of Colombia's premier hospitals. This has become the latest symbol of the struggle to resolve a displacement crisis that five years after the country's peace accords is only getting worse. Colombia has nearly 5 million internally displaced people, a number surpassed only by Syria and the Democratic Republic of Congo. That includes at least 82,846 who were displaced forcibly between January and November 2021, a 169% increase from 2020, the largest number in five years since the government signed a historic peace deal with the Revolutionary Armed Forces of Colombia. According to the Bogota-based Consultancy of Human Rights and Displacement, also known as CODHES, Nearly 23% of those victims were indigenous, and at least 9,857 were forced from Choco, home to many of the Embera families in the park campsite. Indigenous groups such as the Embera have long distrusted Colombia's institutions, a result of the country's failure to follow through on promises to provide these communities with health services, food security, or safe territories. Families displaced by Colombia's decades-long conflict have a right to reparations and restitution through a comprehensive victim's law, which provides state support toward education, health, housing, employment, and more. But for many families, government aid has fallen short. Eight of ten households of victims of forced displacement in Colombia say they are living in poverty. According to the Commission for Monitoring Public Policy on Forced Displacement, a Colombian group, Four of ten stopped eating three times a day during the pandemic. One of those families was Keracamas, living in the park they have depended on donations for food. And in the days leading up to Yonkin's death, the parents and children would often eat only one meal, usually some rice, potatoes, and plantains. That's all for today on the Leo Podcast. I'm Kevin Munoz, and as always, feel free to send me a message with your thoughts or with any interesting topic that you'd like to see covered. And for those of you on Patreon, I'll see you there. Otherwise, I'll see you all in next week's episode.
Thank you for listening to today's episode. If you enjoyed it, please share it with a family or a friend and rate it five stars on Apple Podcasts and Spotify. It helps tremendously in order to bring more awareness and educational resources to our community. For more information and to stay up to date with what I'm doing, you can follow me on Instagram at Latinamericaneo. And if you need more information and resources, you can visit my website, latinamericaneo.org. I'm Kevin Munoz. This has been the Leo Podcast, and I'll see you next time. This podcast is not investment advice. I am not a qualified, licensed investment advisor. All information on here, including any ideas, opinions, views, predictions, forecasts, commentaries, suggestions, or stock picks expressed or implied are for informational, entertainment, or educational purposes only and should not be construed as personal investment advice. Conduct your own due diligence or consult a licensed financial advisor or broker before making any and all investment decisions. Any investments, trades, speculations, or decisions made on the basis of any information found on this podcast, expressed or implied, are committed at your own risk, financial or otherwise.